بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Your Excellencies Esteemed Guests Respectable Faculty and Colleagues On behalf of the Ambassador Society we would like to welcome you all today to Georgetown University in Qatar Our honorable guest today has been locally dubbed as Faris Al-Hisar translating to Night of the Blockade. His Excellency's consistent efforts at the very beginning of and throughout the blockade showcased his determination in sharing Qatar's story. His Excellency was appointed as Minister of Foreign Affairs in January of 2016 and later appointed as Deputy Minister in November of 2017. In addition, His Excellency has been Chairman of the Qatar Investment Authority since November of 2017, 2018. His Excellency is also a member of the Supreme Council for Economic Affairs and Investments, the highest decision-making body concerning energy, investments, and economy in Qatar. He currently serves as the chairman of the Qatar Development Fund, a public development institution committed to improving the livelihood of communities around the world. Our moderator for today is Dr. Ahmed Bedal, the Dean of Georgetown University since 2017. Prior to his position at Georgetown University, he served as provost at the American University of Beirut and the chair of the Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Dean Dalad has written and lectured on a wide variety of topics, ranging from the Islamic disciplines of learning in medieval and early modern Islamic societies to Islamic law. Please help me in welcoming Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani in conversation with Dean Ahmed Dalal. Welcome, Your Excellency. We are honored to have you with us today. We are very privileged uh, that, that you could make time to be with us. And I'm thankful to the Ambassador Society for the initiative that they've taken and the work they've done in preparation for this, uh, for this work. You got a sense of uh, how much respect they have to you and how, how much they look up to you. And, uh, and, and I'm sure all for very, very good reason. Uh, not many countries are tested the way Qatar was tested two summers ago when the blockade was imposed. As we historians know, outcomes of events of this scale always depend on the human beings who make the choices and decisions in response to such historical crises. Your Excellency, you were Faris al-Hisar. You were one of the core group of leaders who orchestrated Qatar's response to the blockade imposed by a coalition of much larger powers. So how did you help respond to this assault on Qatar's national sovereignty? Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for, for hosting me today. I'm, I'm really honored to be among you. Uh, we are very proud of, of Georgetown uh, Qatar campus, which we see that uh, until now they have achieved around 440 graduates. 12 of them are, are working with us uh, in MOFA, and they were part of the team who worked against the blockade and uh, uh, on all uh, the issues that Qatar uh, is facing in, in the foreign policy. Uh, we are also very proud of the diversity that Qatar campus has, which we believe, I think, more than the main campus. Uh, it's more than 50 nationalities who are studying uh, here. Uh, regarding, regarding the blockade and, and uh, the challenges that Qatar faced in, in 2017, May 2017, uh, we, uh, first of all, it, uh, the strategy that, that Qatar uh, adopt uh, facing this blockade wasn't an individual effort or uh, it wasn't just uh, uh, decisions that's been taken as, as a reactionary decision. It was 
a wise leadership led by His Highness the Emir and uh, all the team that work together in the government and outside the government, with, um, uh, along with the people who are uh, either the citizens or uh, the people who are living uh, in Qatar, we adopted a strategy for, for the entire country to uh, face and to confront uh, this challenge. And uh, this strategy mainly uh, is to protect, first of all, to protect our national security and making sure that the people are not affected uh, in our country. Anyone who's living in Qatar should not feel that there is any difference in his life, uh, in his uh, requirement uh, for, for, for his living, but also from security perspective and from uh, defense uh, angle as well. Uh, then uh, the other factor was the political factor, which mainly intensify our engagement with our partners, with our friends and allies and making sure that uh, since this crisis has been has started based on disinformation on fabrication on lies that uh, we are relying uh, the facts and the reality and the truth for for those partners and making sure that our collaborative efforts are not uh, affected uh, and the third pillar was uh, looking at the humanitarian aspect and address the cause of uh, our the causes of our people. So either it's uh, addressing the issues legally in, in different international fora, or helping and assisting them in uh, overcoming the challenges that uh, was a result of uh, of this crisis. Uh, what we have seen uh, during this crisis, without also the unity of of the home front we wouldn't be able to face all these challenges just because of, of this strategy. And we think that the people of Qatar, uh, whoever was living here, played a major and vital role in, in the face of, of, uh, of this crisis. And also the measured uh, decisions that we have taken uh, throughout this challenge since it started with, with the cyber attack on, on the country has contributed a lot in managing the situation and not to get not getting it out of control, which everybody was uh, was sensing at the beginning of the crisis, that might lead to a regional escalation, which which will be uh, affecting the entire regional security. Thank you. The blockade had a significant impact on the economy, politics, and society of Qatar. So from your vantage point, Your Excellency, how did the blockade influence Qatar's politics and society specifically? And what are Qatar's present day priorities at the national and international diplomatic fronts? Well, the blockade has, has not affected Qatar only, but uh, if we will look at it from, from a regional angle, uh, it has been a turning point for the entire regional uh, geopolitics because uh, if we will see since uh, June 5th, uh, we can just go through the events which took place after the blockade, right after the blockade. We have seen that uh, one of them is, was an imprisoning of, of uh, the Prime Minister of Lebanon, uh, the escalation in, in Yemen, uh, and there are uh, escalations in Libya, which are uh, continuous. Uh, the situation in Syria has been much worse. Uh, although people are measuring this situation based on just the level of violence, but they they don't measure it on, on the overall picture. So we see that this blockade has hindered all the regional uh, security efforts that were carried out by, by the GCC as the most stable uh, group in, in, in the Arab region. Uh, uh, also, uh, it, has, it has an impact uh, on, on, on the national level. Uh, the first, of course, the first weeks, the economic impact was uh, a factor uh, over here in Doha, but uh, uh, we have adopted a strategy uh, from the beginning uh, to face any uh, possible challenges, which was among them uh, the blockade. And uh, this strategy, uh, thanks uh, to God, it worked uh, 
alhamdulillah, uh, in a way that we had minimized the effect on, on the economy. And uh, the economy compared now, the Qatar economy compared to the other countries, also the blockading states has uh, grew much better than the others in the region. And it's also it's opened uh, the eyes of, of the Qatari uh, businesses and the main economic player to uh, different markets, which uh, allowed us also to diversify our, our supply base. Uh, on on uh, on the humanitarian level, uh, of course, there was a big impact, and this is when you look at the families who've been separated uh, because of of this blockade. Uh, the way our people has been mistreated in in the blockading states has had a major impact on uh, on the life of of our people, and we wanted to make sure that uh, they are not. Uh, we minimize uh, the effect on them by trying to uh, address and to help support them uh, throughout the process to get back uh, their rights. Uh, the, the priorities for, for, for Qatar currently in managing uh, the situation, it's not, it's not just uh, that we have been responsive uh, to the blockade, but now it's, uh, it's a status which the country is living in, and we need to uh, direct our strategy in order to ensure the well-being of, of our people uh, on the national level, focusing on our human uh, capital development and focusing on diversifying our economy. And on the, in the international uh, level, you uh, see that Qatar has expanded its partnership, uh, whether bilaterally or multilaterally, in trade and energy uh, and investment. But the blockade actually uh, has helped us in, in taking different factors in consideration. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm sorry about the microphone. No problem. <laughs> These are the perils of modern technology. <laughs> <laughs> to date, Qatar's response to the blockade has been remarkably, remarkably systematic. Uh, from the perspective of any outside observer, and not just from an internal perspective, but its impact will go far beyond the present, I think. Not just on life in Qatar, which, as you told us, has been managed and has been managed fairly effectively, but also on the future regional and international relations. In your view, what are some of the long-term consequences of the post-blockade alignments on the regional uh, political landscape and on global energy policies? Well, I think uh, the first consequence which we have to look at after uh, the blockade is the loss of trust, which is very important in, in the international relation. And uh, since this uh, confidence uh, between the countries and uh, a confidence in the system of the multilateralism, whether it's GCC or Arab League, and these systems that Qatar has been enrolling in uh, since its establishment, uh, has been uh, not effective to resolve or to address the issue of, of the Qatari people, then uh, the level of confidence in, in all these uh, multilateral systems has, has been uh, very much uh, decreased. And uh, in some of them has been diminished, honestly. Uh, I think that uh, one of the major changes post the blockade is uh, we have to take in consideration a lot of calculations whenever we are talking about reforming our current multilateral system, whether it's in the, in the GCC or, or in, the other, uh, in the Arab League, or in enrolling in uh, any other uh, regional uh, or international organization, that it will address the need of the country when, it, when it's needed. Uh, we have seen also uh, it's, it's been more also polarizing for, for the region. Uh, after the blockade, uh, it's been uh, always uh, considered uh, which axis you are belonging to. Are you belong to the axis of Saudi UAE or you are belong to the axis of Qatar? And this axis of Qatar, there are tries of uh, and attempts by, by the blockading states to uh, tie it to the axis of Qatar, Iran, Turkey. 
which is not the reality, but this is a narrative that they are trying to promote uh, in order to support and to justify uh, the blockade that they have imposed on, on Qatar. But our concern is that this uh, access things in, in, in our region and this polarization in our region is going to increase and going to lead to more geopolitical conflicts and more and more uh, uh, tensions that will put the solution uh, much farther than, than what it is not right now. Uh, I think this is, this is uh, one of the things that needs a major review by the region. Uh, Qatar has proposed several times that the entire region need to sit together and to agree on a new regional security principles that respect each other's sovereignty, that a principles that's been built based on, on cooperation, uh, based on uh, common interest for, for, uh, for all the countries in, in our region, and to be more inclusive and not exclusive. I think this is the only way forward, post the blockade of Qatar, to start rebuild the trust. There is, there is a, an example of, uh, of Europe, which is right now not a good example to, to give, but it started after, after World Wars. It started after the death of millions of people. And it started by trade. And they evolved to a system that now they are, more or less they are having their common foreign policy, common custom and trade policy which is something that we don't say that the region should replicate, but we should benefit from. We should look at as, as an example that might lead to a peaceful uh, coexistence together. Uh, the impact also on, on, on the energy landscape is, is uh, uh, I won't say for Qatar, uh, specifically, Qatar is, is a powerful player in, in the energy supply, especially in the LNG. It's uh, controlling around 30% of the natural gas supply in the world. And uh, it is significant, uh, I think. And what Qatar did in, in its measures uh, to who face the blockade, we, we made sure that we don't miss any uh, supply any any shipment for the LNG for any country that relying on us, including one of the blockading states, which is UAE, because we believe that uh, taking measures uh, because of of uh, driven by political reason will hurt Qatar reputation in the in the future that we don't want to have, because Qatar wants to remain to be a reliable uh, energy supplier. But from the other hand, we see that the other uh, source of energy, especially when you are talking about the fossil fuel, has been very much politicized. And after this polarization in the region start, started to be used as a political tool as well. So uh, this will have, will have an impact uh, on the, the, the future of, of the geopolitics of the region. Um, we don't see yet the major impact of on the energy market, but if there is any instability, it's all correlated. So, so there is there is a shock that will happen to this energy market if, there, if anything will happen to this region. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, Your Excellency, I know that uh, you want to give our audience and especially our students a chance to ask questions, but. Before I open the floor, if you uh, would allow me one more question. Um, uh, allow me to move the conversation from the national level to a more personal level. In addition to your pivotal leadership role in the nation's foreign ministry, and more recently as the chair of Qatar Development Fund, uh, you are a role model for Qataris, uh, and especially to our students who graduate with a foreign service degree. So tell us, if you will, please, about your own career path. And what is your advice to students aspiring to serve their country and society? Uh, I'm proud to be a role model. Our role model is, is, is our Amir. Uh, 
first of all, and we see how hardworking he is in order to serve his nation and his people, and we have to, we are just replicating what he is doing. Uh, so all of us here, we are servant of, of, of this country. And what we have been doing is, uh, is just a small part from the others. And I believe everybody is, is going to contribute to, uh, to this country. All the graduates of, of, this, uh, of the School of Foreign Service are going to contribute uh, to this country in the future. The only advice I would give any of them, uh, just love what you do. That's, that's what you need to do. You need to uh, believe before you do anything that whatever you are going to make, it will make a difference, whether it's for your country or for your society or for your own organization. And this difference will have an impact. Uh, don't see whatever you do is, is small. We believe it, it, will, it will contribute. All these small, small things will aggregate together and will contribute to a bigger change. In, in this country and will contribute to a bigger change in the region. I never believed that I will be one day a foreign minister, but uh, I've been believing in what I was doing since the beginning, and I have achieved this, and I'm very proud uh, to serve with His Highness now, Sheikh Tamim, uh, as, as a foreign minister, to serve under his leadership and to, ser to serve him in other sectors as well. And I believe all of you will have this chance in the future. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for coming to Georgetown. My name is Thanat Salabi. I am an alumni of Georgetown. Um, I have a quick question about the role of cybersecurity that uh, you think is going to happen in international relations in Qatar. We saw one of the biggest tools used in the beginning of the blockade was the hacking that happened in Qatar by the blockading countries. And recently we've been reading about um, Saudi Arabia hacking Jeff Bezos as um, retaliation for what's been, ha what's been posted in the Washington Post for the Jamal Khashoggi case. So I'm just wondering in your opinion and your expertise, where do you think cybersecurity has a role in international relations in Qatar in the future? Thank you so much. Well, uh, I'm not an expert in the cybersecurity, but uh, if we will look at, at the current crisis, it's all started with, with a cyber attack. And it's showing that how uh, cyber, issue, cyber attacks and cyber warfare can affect uh, country security and can destabilize an entire region uh, because of, of uh, just the absence of the framework in, in, in protecting countries from uh, cyber warfare. Uh, we have raised this issue in different international fora that there is a missing of international framework or international treaty that uh, making sure uh, countries are protected from uh, cyber warfare and making sure that the people who are conducting uh, any uh, wrongdoing uh, in the cyber sphere will be held accountable. Uh, His Highness the Emir in, in the last uh, United Nations General Assembly has mentioned this in his speech that uh, Qatar wants to work together with the other member states in order to develop such a framework for uh, ensuring that the countries are protected from uh, any cyber attacks, ensuring that uh, anyone who is going to uh, conduct cyber attack, he will calculate the consequences. We have seen reports now uh, recently, countries who are hiring former intelligence officers to hack the privacy of, of, uh, of citizens, uh, either here in Qatar or elsewhere. And uh, this is a very, very dangerous uh, thing, very dangerous indication for it started to threaten our lives, our private lives, that it will be just exposed for the public and will be used just for political reason. So we didn't spare any effort speaking in different international fora that this cyber, uh, the cyber element of, of, uh, of the new uh, world is, is need to be addressed, need to be addressed as part of the international relation principles between uh, different countries. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Maryam Al Thani, and I just had a question regarding, um, actually, it links quite well with the previous question. You um, 
you mentioned that the blockade had started with the fabrication of the media. And I had just wanted to know, like, because we saw the emergence of Sheikh Tamim on Twitter, um, the MOFA, and uh, even your personal, like, public account had tweeted the most in English. What role has the media played in um, getting, like, public support or, like, public, um, you know, knowledge about this topic? Well, uh, Qatar has been uh, subject to orchestrated campaign before the blockade and before the cyber attack. And we have noticed this a uh, few months earlier. And we started to investigate and try to find out who, what's behind it. And uh, unfortunately, we found that there were some of the blockading seats standing behind uh, all this uh, disinformation campaign. And uh, also, uh, what we found out that there are a lot of uh, companies who are using new technology, like uh, what they call the tweet bots and the others, in order to spread uh, all these uh, fabricated news. Uh, what we try to do from our side is, is just to make sure that our message is out, that the counter narrative is there, and we don't uh, defend ourselves by attacking the others. We defend ourselves by making our case. Uh, if we want to attack the blockading states, they are very vulnerable. We can, there are a lot of elements and, uh, that we can look at and we just expose it. But Qatar didn't want to go into the same direction they have adopted. They've been ma making up uh, this information about Qatar, which was based on lies and fabrication. And uh, we, made, we made our case very clear for, uh, for everybody through the media, through the direct communication, uh, reaching out to the people, uh, myself and my colleagues from different agencies. We've been traveling around the world, explaining for, uh, for, uh, for all, all the uh, parts of the societies uh, over there, whether in the West or in some of the uh, Arab countries that uh, this is not the case. And uh, the case has been all fabricated uh, against Qatar. And uh, the media has, has played uh, a major role uh, in helping also in, in showing uh, the truth. But uh, this is only the responsible media, not uh, the responsible media, which is trying just to spread out these lies. Assalamu alaikum. Asim al Walid al Thani, Wazar al Dafa, GUQ 2022. Your Excellency, I have to ask, what do you believe are the factors necessary for a solution to the blockade, or if a solution can be reached? <laughs> well, when I cannot, I cannot predict, but uh, if the solution will be reached, Qatar has explained its position from the beginning. We are open uh, if uh, the other countries are, are willing to engage in uh, a reasonable manner uh, in, in a discussion. And I won't call it a negotiation because they need to put their grievances forward and they have to prove these uh, grievances. Qatar remains ready. Qatar didn't change its position from the beginning of the blockade. And uh, when this is going to happen, uh, it will only happen if there is a willingness from both parties and uh, we have uh, all of us appreciated the efforts that Amir of Kuwait has carried out since the start of this blockade which also prevented the blockading states from taking further uh, uh, aggressive actions against against this country uh, but unfortunately uh, those uh, these efforts were not respected by by the blockading states uh, we believe that the only way forward will be through uh, a negotiation table. And this is this is will only happen when those countries will start to realize that the blockade is not the answer for uh, what their concerns, whatever uh, they are. Uh, mine isn't an academic question, but uh, my question is, when did you recognize the emotional warmth from the expat community for His Highness, the Emir, yourself and the government? And has this emotional warmth positively impacted on Qatar's resolve to stay steadfast post-blockade? 
of course we have we have sensed this from from day one and i mentioned this in in, uh, in the first question here that uh, uh, without the support of, of the home front, uh, we wouldn't be able to face this challenge. And when I'm talking about the home front, we see that the people who are living here are united, whether they are Qatari or, or uh, an expat community, which we highly appreciate that they are contributing to the development of, of the society. And we believe that they have a vital role also in the future of the de development of, uh, of the country. And uh, I think this is, has been sensed not by us only as, as a government, but also by the people of Qatar. Assalamu alaikum, Shayman Naimi, former Georgetown. Your Excellency, my question to you is as chairman of QIA. It's been reported that Qatari entities want to increase their stake in Deutsche Bank through QIA buying in the open markets. However, there is still uncertainty looming over the merger of Deutsche Bank due to several reasons. A, uh, they're facing Qatari resistance due to share dilution if they were to raise capital. Uh, and B, we're still unclear of whether this merger would actually strengthen the bank. So my question is, if Qatar were to back this merger, would this translate into more uh, bilateral deals with Germany and other industries? Well, uh, I was never expecting a question like this. Here. <laughs> uh, and the general sorry, but, but, but the media has been pushing to get an answer from any of us about this, and I never answer them, and I, will, I, will not, I cannot answer you. But I can answer you on your second part, which is uh, more uh, bilateral relation and investments with Germany. Uh, Qatar has, uh, we, are, we are considered one of the largest Arab investor uh, in Germany, or I think we are the largest over there. Our investments there are performing very well, whether it's in financial services, in industry, and different sectors. And also, uh, we have done uh, the conference last year, last September, uh, about, about uh, to invest in Germany and to encourage our private sector to invest over there. And part of the commitment and the pledges that Qatar pledged for to invest in Germany has been already executed, and we are looking forward in other deals in the pipeline. Hi, uh, my name is Mohammed Abu Hawash. I'm a senior here at Georgetown. So I have uh, two questions. The first one is um, regarding a, a, a research that was done by the Center for International and Regional Studies here. Um, they published a book called Environmental Politics of the Middle East. And in it, they analyzed uh, you know, the impact of milk production in Qatar. So after the blockade, Qatar purchased something like 8,000 cows. And you know, it's led to uh, sustain sustainable milk production here, at least to self-sustain. But in the long run, this is going, this is going to have tremendous uh, you know, uh, environmental impact on Qatar and is causing a huge strain on the water resources of the country. So my question to you is, what is the role of the foreign ministry in, mit in mitigating this challenge? Uh, you know, over the long run, this is going to have a lot of uh, a huge impact on the country. And the second question is regarding uh, what you mentioned you know, with, with increasing economic interaction in the, middle, in the Arab world. And you used the EU as an example. So the Arab Customs Union was formed in, in uh, 2001, and it has led to uh, increased uh, economic and trade relations between uh, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, and other countries. But Qatar never joined. So my question is: uh, Is do you think you know, or is Qatar interested in joining? And why did it not uh, join it in the past? Uh, well, uh, first of all, regarding uh, the production of, of the milk and dairy uh, in Qatar, uh, when Qatar decided not to invest in this sector uh, earlier, because first of all, because of the one market which we uh, used to believe in, in the GCC, that making sure that uh, in each country they will have their own competitive uh, edge for some products that the other countries will be uh, dependent on. What we have faced in this challenge and in, in the blockade, um, we have lost trust and confidence. This is uh, what we have just mentioned here. So the country has to invest on, uh, on the basic needs of, of our people. And one of the basic needs is, is the dairy. So that's why uh, we have mobilized our efforts. The private sector here mobilized its effort to, in order to make sure that uh, they can provide the sufficient supply for uh, the people who are living. Uh, 
we understand very well the environmental concern that will um, it might lead to, but we cannot also uh, avoid the fact that our people need such a product and we need to see what kind of solution we can provide to avoid uh, being in front of a crisis in, in, uh, in the water. So the d different agencies are, each, each of the agencies are working and doing its role and making sure that new technologies are, are introduced uh, and to try to find solutions. And the role of, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, is of course, it's uh, organizing and coordinating the international relationship between the uh, concerned agencies with uh, their counterparts in other countries and making sure that Qatar can benefit from any international organization technical assistance in this uh, field. Regarding uh, when I, I talked about uh, new regional security arrangements that needs to be uh, based on, on cooperation. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what were the reasons why Qatar didn't join the custom union uh, at the beginning, the Arab custom union at the beginning, but I'm sure that uh, our predecessors uh, has uh, conducted a review that, uh, and they have seen that it might cost them more than it's benefiting uh, them, and that's why they decided not to join. But what we are talking about is uh, mo uh, is a wider region, uh, wider regional approach that uh, either it's uh, on, on the trade, on the customs, but it, it might not start with the custom union, but might lead to a custom union in, in one day. And this is not necessarily only the Arab region because the connectivity uh, and uh, we have seen that it's been like the proximity from Qatar to Pakistan, now it's, it's equal to Qatar to Jordan. So uh, Pakistan is also considered part of this region. Iran now they are facing a lot of challenges because of the embargo and, and the sanctions. But when they, Iran is a nation that will stay and Qatar is another country that will stay, when they we will have to uh, also to open the trade with them and we want to make sure that there is a collaborative approach, approach between the GCC and, and and, uh, and Iran and, uh, and trade. Turkey is another big market, which is also very close by Azerbaijan, the other Central Asian countries. So we believe in, in, in the wider region that's not just include the Arab region, but we want to see the Arab region go together to Central Asia and form uh, a new regional approach that based on cooperation. Um, hi, my name is Maria Al-Harti. Um, so my question is, uh, pre-blockade, uh, Qatar held a very important position as a mediator in regional conflicts. So how do you think the blockade affected that position? Um, didn't affect. We are still a mediator in different conflicts. Uh, in fact, we've been just hosting uh, Taliban in the U.S. Uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, the negotiations are ongoing. Qatar also uh, has continued its mediation effort when it comes to the Palestinian uh, reconciliation uh, Darfur agreement, which is which is called Doha Agreement. Here, uh, also Qatar is still uh, engaging with the different parties to join. Uh, who, who didn't join the Darfur agreement to come and to uh, join the agreement. So uh, the priorities at the beginning of the blockade has changed and this is, this is normal because we prioritize uh, some uh, interests which are more uh, related to affecting our national security. But then after we managed the situation over there, we came back uh, as active as we were before. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dan al a George, a junior at Georgetown, and I was wondering, um, Qatar has been using and utilizing soft power for quite a long time. And in light of blockade, do you think Qatar has approached soft power from a different angle, and in what manner? Uh, Qatar, Qatar is, is a small country. It is, as I mentioned, a powerful energy supplier. It is an active investor and a political player. So uh, it doesn't have 
you know, uh, and also it's not living in living in in, uh, in a peaceful neighborhood. Let me put it this way: we are surrounded by big neighbors, and uh, we don't know uh, some of them uh, getting up in one day and changing their minds and uh, do whatever they have done uh, to us in, in, in 2017. So we need to invest in, in, in Qatar relations and uh, with others. We need to invest in, uh, in the soft power. We need to invest. But this investment in the soft power will be as Qatar as, as a force for good, as Qatar uh, that contribute to the world and contribute to the humanity. In fact, if we, are, if we, are, if we look at just uh, the development aid for Qatar, Qatar has been very consistent in, in, uh, in its development agenda that keep the uh, the human uh, development at the core of, of our development agenda when we are looking at different countries. Qatar, last year, uh, Qatar Development Fund has helped around 71 countries. It's uh, not necessarily that they are only Arabs, but Arabs and, and, and other countries, not necessarily that only Muslim countries, but also Muslim and other countries. Uh, the, the funds been dispersed around $585 million. 30% of this, these funds has gone to education because we focus on the future generation. We focus that we need to build for uh, the f for the future of, of the stability, the peace and the stability in the world. We need to provide those young people with, uh, with some tools and some weapons, but this weapon will not be a gun, it will be a pen. And this is what we are trying to fight with. Uh, other other thing, Qatar, uh, I will call Qatar soft power. Uh, it's a friendly relation. Qatar is a non-hostile to any other country. Uh, either it's trying to help in, in putting down a conflict, or it's trying to help in providing uh, a development aid. And uh, also defending the causes of, of uh, our people and our nation and our, our region. I mean, if we will, if we are going to talk about Syria, Libya, Palestine, all these conflicts, Qatar has stood with the people. They didn't stand with uh, with uh, governments who are oppressing their people. So this is this is maybe what made Qatar uh, called as uh, a, cont a small country with with uh, a powerful soft power. Your Excellency, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Sarah Lamtotah. Uh, I'm a student here at Georgetown. And my question pertains to the GCC as a regional organization and whether the ties between the member states have been severed to a point of no return. And if that is the case, um, is there really a point in the GCC? Well, the GCC will remain uh, uh, as a framework, is an important framework. And uh, it's not uh, only uh, Qatar, but Qatar and all the six member states believes in, in uh, that this framework is important for our uh, regional cooperation, for our coexistence as well. But how beneficial is this framework for the countries? This is the question. What did it make for the people of our countries? There is a, a lot of review need to be conducted, a self review need to be conducted for the GCC in order to be effective. Now we have seen that uh, there was a hostility from three uh, countries toward one country. And we have seen that this framework didn't serve. We have seen that uh, the GCC itself has been paralyzed. It couldn't take any, any role. It couldn't even put out a statement to de-escalate the situation. So it means that the GCC as a framework is either hijacked by one of the blockading states or uh, it's just ineffective and need to have a major uh, review. We have to bring this uh, conversation to, to an end. Thank you for, for your thoughtful uh, input today and also for taking the time from your very busy schedule. I hope this will be the beginning of a well, it's not the beginning, a continuation, a milestone in a very productive relationship. And you've seen the excitement amongst our student body and, and the Qatar Foundation student body. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to, to train our students to contribute meaningfully to their nation. Thank you so much for thank, being Thank you us. very much for hosting me. Thank you. Very much.